No lizards. No aliens. No nonsense. This is Reality Bites in association with Sovereign Independent UK and One World Chronicle. Bites on the 18th of November 2014. Uh, this is not Paul alive, as you can have guessed. It's uh, it's Neil, and uh, I'm covering for Paul tonight. As uh, well, I'm covering for Paul tonight. That's it. Uh, we have a guest tonight, Brandon Turbeville. Have I pronounced that right, Brandon? Hey Neil, thanks for having me on. Yep. Um, you write many articles for a number of sites, uh, including Activist Post, amongst others, uh, and you have your own site, uh, BrandonTurbeville.com. Um, do you want to give us a little bit of your background and explain how you, you got into all this? Yeah, sure. Uh, as you mentioned, I, I'm a writer for ActivistPost.com as well as a couple of other sites like the Antimedia.org and Irrelevant Paradigm. And I'm also, uh, I've got my own website, which is kind of the hub of all my work, BrandonTurbeville.com. got my own radio show as well. I do once a week for about an hour called Truth on the Tracks over at UCY.tv. And um, I, I write on a, a number of different subjects. I've focused more on geopolitics as of late, but you know, over the over time, I've written about 450 or so odd articles. So it's covered many more things than just uh, geopolitics. And um, I've got six books out. The latest is The Road to Damascus: The Anglo-American Assault on Syria, which covers the uh, situation in Syria. It's it's a couple years old now, but it follows the situation from the beginning up to, well, where we were a couple of years ago, but it gives you a good background on what actually was transpiring and who was behind it and who were the players in the, in the Syrian crisis. And as for how I got into all of this, uh, this information, it, you know, I, I guess I should say that, I mean, I've always kind of felt that there was something about, uh, about the world that wasn't quite 
what I was being told through um, through media, through uh, religion or schooling, and uh, you know, I, it turns out that I was right after I found uh, several sources of information. Kind of went down a, a long rabbit hole and and started doing research uh, that was a little deeper than just watching a documentary or two, but actually going into um, the uh, the actual documents and and looking at some historical uh, books and, and even watching things as they unfold live. I think one of the biggest things for me was 9/11 personally, and uh, that that to me was when I really started to question the the nature of um, of, of events as they unfold and uh, across the world and, and here at home. So, you know, it, it's been it's been a long road, but you know, at, at this point when you figure out that this this type of system and this you know overarching agenda really does exist you know you have to uh, to do what you can to expose it and to stop it and replace it with something else yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with you um, uh, again um, like yourself I, I kind of always had this opinion that there was something wrong with the world but uh, couldn't quite put my finger on what it was and there was always a bit of a, a rebel at school and never really paid much attention to, to what the teachers had to say but uh, always kind of got by and um, yeah, on on the day of 9-11, I mean, it's, it's one of those things you know, everybody remembers when Elvis was Elvis died or, or whatever, John Lennon was shot. But 9-11, um, I, I used to have a cafe in Ireland, and I'd, I'd driven off to the cash and carry, and uh, they had the TV in the cash and carry, and I saw the, the first the first tower um, being hit. And I, I, I thought, oh, this is, this, is, this is quite bizarre, you know? And uh, at that time, I, I didn't know they were talking about terrorism because there was no sound on the TV. There was just they were just showing this um, footage over and over again and I I drove back home instead of going back to the cafe and uh, then I saw the second one being hit and it, it, at that point I just thought this this just isn't right there's something just not right about this it just these things just don't happen these things just don't fall down like this um, and I didn't know anything technical about um, the structure of buildings or anything like that, but it just didn't sit right and uh, like yourself I started looking at um, all sorts of things and uh, yeah, there's some some rabbit holes you go down. and You think, well, that's that's not right either, and you you crawl back up those ones and go down other ones. But uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you know, Neil, it, for me, it, it wasn't the um, it wasn't actually the building collapse that that made me start to question the uh, the, the official story of 9/11. It was actually the response of the government. It was the Patriot Act that just happened to be you, you know set up waiting. For, uh, for 9-11 to happen. In fact, just as a quick aside, uh, since we have some time here, I'll mention that, you know, years before 9-11, I was, I was driving down the road, and <laughs> of all people, I, I had uh, Howard Stern's radio show on. And, uh, you know, so don't judge me, but I was listening to it. And uh, they were discussing a law that, w that was being considered, which would have given the FBI and uh, and and intelligence agencies the right to read emails or read or maybe not so much emails but telephone calls and and uh, mail and so forth of American citizens and he was he told the person who reported that to him that he thought they were crazy there was a conspiracy theory and all that and then they actually called the FBI office and the gentleman who answered uh, their call uh, flatly told them that yeah you could expect in the next few years that uh, that the FBI would have this power and that it was going, it was going to happen. Uh, the question was just when, not not if. And you know, I, I listened to that, and I thought, you know, that's that's scary. I don't want the government to have that that power. And then years later, we have 9/11 uh, occurring, and the Patriot Act is just sitting there waiting. And that was one of the things that stuck in the back of my mind was, wait a minute, I remember years ago hearing about this this uh, you know this law that was that was being crafted and this policy that the the intelligence agency wanted and then i saw as it unfolded the um you know the, the rhetoric that was being used i remember bush saying let let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories and at the time i, I heard that i thought well what are the conspiracy theories because I, I i didn't know there were, were any and you know i ended up at the time i was reading George Orwell's 1984 for the first time. And what I was reading in the book, I was watching in real time 
right here in the United States, right here on uh, on the television. And then it started to click to me, maybe the official story of these events is not entirely true. And then you start to think, well, maybe maybe they actually knew it was going to happen and let it happen in order to, to get certain things passed or, or to get certain agendas pushed through. And then you start looking at the information and realize, no, it actually goes much deeper than that, that they didn't just let it happen, that it was orchestrated and, and controlled from the very, very beginning to the very end. Yeah, I, I mean, the um, the building collapse was my initial response. And then, like yourself, you, you start looking at things. And uh, in the UK, it, all of a sudden, we had um, armed armed policemen with soldiers at the airports and with machine guns. And, and like you say, there were all, all these laws were ready to come in. And suddenly, we're all taking our shoes off at airports and belts and, you know, all sorts of ridiculous stuff. Um, I mean, we come to the stage where a, a plastic bag is supposed to stop a, a tube of toothpaste blowing up. Uh, and, and ridiculous things. Like, I mean, I've, I've even gone. To, I mean, every time I travel from the UK on my own, I'm stopped and searched. And I keep saying to them, I say, you know, I think it's nine times out of ten now, where I've travelled myself and I've been stopped. And every time I travel with somebody else, they're stopped. And um, I just say to them, how come this is random when I'm getting stopped every time I do it? Oh, I said, you're just you're just uh, unlucky. I said, well, you know, really? I said, well, I'd, I'd love to go to a bookies and get some odds on this because it, it must be, like, astonishing. I'd like to put some money on it that I'm going to get stopped every time I come through the airport. They said, oh, no, it's just random. It's just random. And then and then one of them actually told me that the uh, the so-called uh, metal detectors don't actually work. They're just uh, set to go off randomly. And, uh, you know, I've said this to, to other people in the airports and said, look, I've been told by one of the, the staff at another airport that these things just go off randomly. And you're telling me I'm getting picked out randomly every time I come through. So wh where's the randomness of that? You know, what are the odds of that? And did this? I, I I don't know what it is about these people, but uh, I I did hear they were employing them on the back of pizza boxes at one time in, in the United States, and um, <laughs> I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if it was the same in the UK. Um, but uh, I, I don't know. But anyway, um, moving on. So your interest in the in the Middle East, wh where did that stem from? Well, I, you know, I, I just, um, w w when this began, this was sort of the tail end of the Arab Spring, I, I was watching the situation in Libya. And, you know, th this, this was the overthrow of Gaddafi and the, the brutal murder of, of Gaddafi that was broadcast all over television. And then in an effort, you know, as, uh, while I was, in, you know, reporting on, on that situation we we saw the beginning of the syrian situation and uh, you know just researching that as it began um you know this it's actually so clear that what this was was a color revolution uh destabilization effort by the u.s government the the, the british government nato in general that you know i just continued uh, you know, following the, the the situation and and reporting on it, so it it started pretty early on. I mean, this this uh, situation began in, around 2010 in earnest when when the uh, death squads and the snipers started firing, uh, you know, s sniping at children and men and women and on the way to the market and on the way to school and so forth. And I just uh, you know I just followed it ever since. So okay, so that brings us to where we are now in this this uh, debacle, if you want to call it that, uh, this organised um, debacle and uh, chaos which has been created in the Middle East uh, over, what, two decades now, or longer. Um, the the whole ISIS thing, yeah, I mean, you've got a, a little uh, piece in your article, uh, ISIS agrees to work with itself. Uh, you've got a little, uh, it's almost like an algebraic uh, equation, uh, I'm just scrolling down to find it, uh, where you've got, um, oh, I can't find it now. I'll well, I, I guess I could kind of recite it to you because it's actually more simple than it, it sounds uh, than than it looks. Because if you just remember that, you know, whether you're talking about ISIS or Al Qaeda or Al Nusra, it's all the same thing. Um, you know, people would do well to to research where all this stuff came from. For instance, uh, you know, just to look at the the, the history of ISIS. I mean, we're given the story that. ISIS just popped up out in the the desert of Iraq and Syria, and it just you know it took large swaths of territory of Iraqi territory, defeating the military, consolidating power, uh, gathering territory in Syria, and the United States just didn't know. We had no idea that it was happening uh, until it had already happened. And you know perhaps they were just too busy reading all of our emails. Perhaps they got backlogged with with our uh, chat data 
or a metadata that they couldn't see that the uh, the, the the ISIS forces were m marching across Iraq and Syria. You know, this is this is beyond belief. Of course, all they had to do was look at the internet and look at Iraqi media reports to see what was happening. Of course, they knew what was happening because they were they were directing it. But the, the history of ISIS itself. If you look at the leader of ISIS, which is Abu uh, Bakr al-Baghdadi, right? You, we've heard a lot about him in uh, recent months. This guy, um, he was at one time the leader of Al Qaeda in Iraq, and uh, he, he was a he was actually a fighter uh, who fought against Saddam Hussein, not not necessarily the Americans at the time, but it, or um, anyone else, but Saddam Hussein, and he eventually became. Uh, designated as the leader of Al Qaeda in Iraq, which itself morphed into the Islamic Emirate of Iraq, right? And the the IEI actually had an uh, sort of a tentacle in Syria. The sister organization to the Islamic Emirate of Iraq was called Al Nusra Front. So it's the same organization, just slightly different name change for for you know crossing a a line in the sand. Uh, then from that, the uh, the name change was uh, was changed to the uh, Islamic Emirate of Iraq and the Levant, which then became the Islamic uh, State of Iraq and the Levant, which then became Islamic State of Iraq and Syria or Sham. Uh, same thing, same organization, and now it's of course of course called the Islamic State. So it's all the same organization. You can call it Al Qaeda. You can call it Al Nusra. You can call it ISIS. You can call it ISIL. IEI doesn't matter. It's the same organization. And this this uh, farce that we're being told that Al Nusra is fighting Al Qaeda and they're fighting ISIS. I mean, you can look at the reports. You can look at the quotes from people like um, Salim Idris. I'm sorry, uh, Basil Idris, uh, who have stated that uh, the Free Syrian Army, for instance, works with ISIS. I should I, I should step back a minute and mention that the Free Syrian Army itself it's painted as the moderate rebels, but there are no moderate rebels in Syria. So again, whether you hear those names of terrorist organizations that I've just mentioned, or whether you hear the name uh, moderate rebels, um, quote unquote opposition fighters, or um, or the Free Syrian Army. You can just assume that they're the same organizations. The Free Syrian Army is well known for atrocities. When the Free Syrian Army would take over territory in Syria, they would engage in imposing Sharia law on the uh, the citizens. They would behead people. They would rape women. Um, they would hang. They they actually hung a, a, like a, a two year old child from a doorpost in Syria. They uh, you know they they've uh, they used to have something called. Um, uh, these brigades that they had, uh, I actually forget the name of them, but they, they were these uh, death brigades that would go around and commit mass scale executions. And this is so called the moderate rebellion. If you remember, there was a gentleman by the name of Abu Sakar, and he was uh, part of the Farouk Brigade. This uh, Abu Sakar was one of the rebels who killed a Syrian soldier and cut out his heart and bit into it for the camera. The Farouk Brigade that he was a leader of was part of the Free Syrian Army. The FSA is an umbrella organization that that you know kind of holds these death squads underneath it. Um, sort of again as an umbrella organization. So uh, the moderate cannibal, I guess we'll call him, was uh, was a part of the Free Syrian Army. So if anybody can look at these names, the first thing you gotta you gotta do is just forget that there that uh, that there's any differences because they're not. Just there's only two groups fighting in Syria, and that is the secular government of Bashar al-Assad and death squad fighters funded by the West. Yeah, ISIS is, I guess, what it is. Is 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 um, the? I mean, the, the the misconception or the the perception of the of the the general public in the West is that there, there are all these factions all fighting amongst each other, but. Uh, you know, ISIS has got the upper hand, and what struck me when this this ISIS first kind of hit the headlines major was that uh, they'd suddenly come into billions of dollars, and uh, nobody could track where the money came from. Now, I've, I've been into a check uh, with a check in a bank uh, with uh, an insurance company's name written on it, and the teller asked me where it came from. Now, 
y you know, <laughs> I can't even cash a cheque for like 200 euro or whatever it was at the time um, without being asked where it came from. Yet uh, we've got a, a supposed terrorist organisation run about the, the deserts in the Middle East um, laundering billions of dollars through through presumably Western banks and uh, nobody can trace that money whatsoever. Yeah, and you know what they they've tried to to put this on, put this on two different things. And the first thing they've tried to say is that um, that, that ISIS is raising money through Twitter. And of course, if you if you know anything about social media, if you're an activist, then you probably understand that Twitter can decide at the drop of a hat, Twitter and Facebook, to suspend your account if if it does something that, or if you post something that. It wants to censor. So in other words, like you know, social media will censor nudity, but but not terrorism. And the the idea is that they're raising so much money from Twitter donations, and this is unbelievable because um, <laughs> we're we're being told that you know there are moderate rebels out there who are just poor and they don't have any money to to procure weapons, and the United States is supporting them. But then there's the ISIS factions, the extremist uh, rebels, the extremist uh, death squad fighters that the United States doesn't want to support, but somehow they can raise more money on Twitter than the United States government can provide the moderate rebels. Yeah, I don't think that's the case. Um, you've also got the question of the oil sales. right? There's, ISIS is now an oil company, ISIS Incorporated, I guess. These guys have seized uh, oil refineries and oil wells all across Syria, and they're they're somehow managing to hold the oil wells. They're managing to extract the oil, ship it, sell it, deliver it, and do it all under the nose of the most you know advanced uh, surveillance state in the world. Uh, not to mention the other NATO countries that are part of it. And we just don't have any idea where this oil is going and where all this money is uh, going to. I don't buy it because it's not realistic. The uh, the other story that's, that's even more laughable is that ISIS is you know, producing all of this oil and selling it to Assad. <laughs> I don't know if you heard that one. The idea here is that ISIS is producing the oil uh, then, then selling the oil to Assad, so Assad will pay money to ISIS, and then use the oil to fight ISIS. It doesn't make any realistic sense that that this would happen. And you know, some of these stories actually just become laughable. Uh, there, there was actually the, an attempt by Western media to portray Assad as the creator of ISIS at one point, and it, you know, you just wonder how. How far this uh, this imbecilic propaganda can go before people will take a look at it and and think you know this this just doesn't make any sense at all. Well, I guess it will go on as long as uh, enough imbecilic people believe it. <laughs> um, but, Which uh, doesn't bode well for the future because I see them believing it pretty easily. Yeah, far too easily. And uh, again, the, the thing about the oil is uh, I could I just couldn't understand that either. Like, who was buying it and and what currency were they paying in it? What, you know, what were they using to buy this stuff? Uh, and as you say, it's it's going on to tankers. Assume it, you you would assume it, it's being sold abroad. If, if they're raking in billions of dollars, uh, or or whatever uh, euros, pounds, whatever, uh, they're, they're having to pay bills. Well, well, there was also the, the 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 suggestion by NATO that we have to stop ISIS and their oil uh, production. You know, to, to cut their funding, that we had to blow up the pipelines. Well. There's a problem with that is because pipelines aren't just uh, you know uh, these aren't you know garden hoses these things have have long trajectories and ISIS doesn't have control of the pipeline ISIS does have control of of a few you know oil rigs but that's not the same as being in control of one's pipelines so this was a justification for U.S. airstrikes in uh, in Syria in in some of these these areas like uh, Deir el Sur this is a place where you know, Syria's Assad was about to regain territory this this has been a scene of fighting for uh, for some time and and over the last few months the tide was really beginning to turn in the favor of Assad and at this point the the Assad forces had actually cut off one of the bridges to where the the death squad fighters were entering entering Deir el Sur and they had surrounded the death squad fighters. So it was only a matter of time before 
the Assad forces had retaken Deir el Sur. Well, what happens right on the precipice of that victory is that the United States comes in and blows up the oil refineries and some of the uh, oil rigs that are out there. And essentially what it does is eliminates any of the gains that Assad would have made had he, you know, well, I mean, he, he is on the way to retaking it regardless, but this this removes the uh, the, the spoils of the battle, right? He would have retaken oil uh, tanks and oil refineries and, and oil uh, rigs so he could use that uh, use that for oil to sell, use that for his military. Well, that's gone now because the United States bombed it. And this is exactly what you're seeing when they bomb oil refineries. This is not oil refineries that uh, this infrastructure does not belong to ISIS. It wasn't built by ISIS. It was built by Assad. It belongs to the Syrian government. But it's being destroyed by the United States for the purpose of weakening the Assad government under the guise of fighting ISIS. Well, it's, it's incredible that uh, all the, with all the, the military might that uh, America, Britain, and uh, whoever else wants to get involved in it, um, that Assad is managing to, to hold out against uh, all this weaponry and uh, subterfuge, if you like, and the use of these death squads, as you, as you say, to, to terrorize his people. Um, what do you think Assad will hold out in the, in the long term, or you know, is, it, is, it, is this just all a ploy to keep this kind of thing going for as long as possible? Well, it, you know, I... I don't really have high hopes for the situation. I, I have a personally. I, I feel that it's 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 really only a matter of time. I hope I'm wrong, but uh, you, know, you you just kind of see how these things have gone. And he's he's held out, uh, you know, unbelievably well. Considering you look what happened to Gaddafi, um, Assad has has fared very well in this uh, this situation, largely because of the alliances with Russia. And you know, Assad has played his his cards pretty well on on most instances, but uh, you know, some of them, I guess, one could question the uh, uh, you know the justification for some of these decisions. But you know, as as for how long it will go on, I'm not really uh, not really positive. There, there's also the option. You know, we have Zbigniew Brzezinski's philosophy of creating micro states and mini states, and this, the idea behind this is creating a state that is so small and so impotent and so one-dimensional that it cannot stand up to the forces of corporations or banks or other larger governments and uh, organizations like NATO. And you're, you're seeing this being done now uh, with the Kurdistan that's now being created. And there have been uh, you know, um, think tanks that have put out papers like the Brookings Institution that desire to have Assyria broken up into three parts, the, the sort of Western... Uh, western part of Syria, from you know D Damascus on over to the you know the Lebanese border, Palestinian border, and to the coast, being under the Assad or secular uh, government uh, that, that's allowed to stay there, and then you've also got the Kurdistan area that's being created now, and then this sort of uh, chimera of, of death squad fanatics in the middle, and that's what uh, you know the Brookings Institution had had put out. On their uh, their own white paper, so uh, you know it, it's it's difficult to say how far it will go. I think personally that the the goal is to completely overthrow Assad and not even really have to worry about the creation of these three different parts of Syria, but it's just to eliminate Assad in general and let the chips fall where they may, let the death squads take over, let chaos reign supreme like it does in Libya, and that is. Uh, you know that's really anybody's guess as, as to how long it will last. What I will say is it looks like time is growing short because you have Turkey calling for openly calling for a buffer zone or a no-fly zone now, and you have the United States calling for the same thing. Well, I mean Turkey, Turkey uh, may, may regret um, wishing for that because uh, I'm sure on, they're on a list somewhere uh, to be kind of taken out as well somewhere down the line. Um, it's happening now, yeah. Yeah, um, I mean they're they're going to get it from all sides, really, uh, Turkey. And um, well, you know, I I lived in Turkey for a year, and uh, I remember back then that was back in 1999, and they had uh, the young lads went off and did their, their national service over to the eastern Turkey, to the the Kurdish area, and uh, most of them came back completely screwed up. And uh, it was basically their Vietnam there, and uh, it was never reported at the time that uh, there was this war going on, basically in the in the far east of of Turkey, 
um, basically like a Vietnam, and uh, nobody talked about it. But uh, these guys were were coming back completely screwed up, and uh, they were in um, nightclubs and stuff, um, biting the tips of their tongues off and all sorts of horrendous stuff. So uh, I don't know what kind of things they'd been witnessing over there, but um, you know. Uh, if it's anything like the savagery we're seeing in Syria, um, well, who can blame them for, for acting like that? Um, we'll go to a piece of music. Do you get people of the world, turn off your television. Yes, yes, or shoot it. People of the world. Stop voting, for the system is rigged. <laughs> you mean broken? I mean, really. When are we, as a people, going to stand up for our rights and take back the world? You mean, get rid of the uh, evil scum? The evil scumbag people who made it this way? I mean, you're all fired. I'm telling you people, all people from around the world and the whole planet, it's time for you, time for you all to awaken and work against the construct, the construct. Wake up. Wake up! Well, yeah. Duh. Tune in to Awake Radio. Straight talk for the awake and the aware. We're back live, as you just said, and we have a guest, um, Brandon Turbeville, with us. Uh, we're going to continue on with the uh, Syrian ISIS situation. And in your article, Brandon, you mentioned that uh, there are no moderates in in this in this um, situation, and uh, I, I suppose that, I mean for all as has faults, I suppose uh, he's probably the most moderate guy there. Um, but um, in terms of the the so-called groups or the one group that's uh, supposedly um, there to to save the world from Assad, um, you mentioned there are no moderates, and you've mentioned one of the uh, atrocities of the guy uh, cutting out the guy the the guy's heart and biting into it for the cameras I mean I don't, I don't know what kind of cameraman would, would sit there and watch that and, and actually film it but uh, there's something wrong with that guy as well I would suggest and uh, he's certainly no moderate himself um, so in terms of the well the the depths that these guys will go to in terms of uh, the brutality I mean do you want to give some examples of that yeah, I don't know if there are, if it can get any worse. I mean, as I said, I did an article early on about many of these rebels who actually took a, a young child who was about two, three years old and killed his family in front of him and then uh, took the child out and killed the child and hung it from a from a doorpost. And there's actually, if you, if you just Google some of the appropriate search terms by name, you'll see the article. We've got the picture up in the article if anybody wants to... Um, you know, to to take a look at that, and then of course we have the the cannibal that you just mentioned. His name was Abu Sakar, um, a friend of John McCain's, by the way. And I've got the photographs up on my website for that. He's actually photographed with John McCain, and you know, the FSA, the burial brigades that they had. Of course, this was mass executions. We we've had all all type of of rapes and um, and and atrocities beheadings it, it, some of the most brutal stuff they uh, the, they forced a child to behead uh, a number of Syrian soldiers which you could find it on YouTube or you know maybe live leak or something if you know, really all you have to do is just google the most disgusting thing you can think of in terms of an atrocity and put Syria next to it and you'll find the handiwork of the western back death squads that that are operating there the um, you know I realized you know, in the in the first segment we I kind of went uh, on a tangent and I and I didn't really flesh it out maybe as as much as I should have in terms of the fact that there aren't any moderates in Syria right the, the idea is not necessarily that uh, some people are committing atrocities and some are not the, the the idea is that in reality all of these groups are exactly the same it's not that ISIS is more extreme than the Free Syrian Army or the you know Al Qaeda. Groups are more extreme than than um, 
you know, uh, the Syrian Revolutionary Front. All of these names are entirely uh, just tangential. They don't really matter. They're just different little brigades that that were formed and 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 uh, and divided and used. Just as as you can name anything, give, give anything a number of names, right? All of these guys were created by NATO and directed by NATO. It all comes from Al Qaeda to begin with, and and I'll I'll mention that as well. But um, we even had an article, despite the mainstream media's attempt to portray these death squads as moderate versus extreme, there was an article in April of 2013 that came out in the New York Times that was written by Ben Hubbard, and Ben Hubbard was was trying to um, give an idea of what the rebel-held areas looked like, and he pointed out that these were, were, were places that were under strict Sharia law, where there were all kinds of atrocities taking place, and his quote, his direct quote was, nowhere in rebel-controlled Syria is there a secular fighting force to speak of. That's a direct quote from the New York Times. So uh, that, that's true, right? In, if there's a rebel-controlled area in Syria, then it is under fundamentalist death squad control. In fact, calling them rebels is a misnomer because they're not rebels. In order to be a rebel uh, against a system, you have to generally live under that system. Most of these people aren't Syrian. They're Saudi Arabians, they're Libyans, and they're Tunisians. In fact, Tunisians make up the bulk of the so-called opposition. Uh, we, we have the Free Syrian Army, as I mentioned earlier, that is supposedly the... the um, moderate opposition, but we've we've got Basil Idris, who was one of the FSA commanders, actually stating that his fighters work with Al Nusra and ISIS. And and we had uh Jamal Marouf, who is the uh, leader of the Syrian Revolutionary Front, saying the the, the same thing. We had uh, Abu Fida, who was a uh, part of the Revolutionary Council, saying that his fighters have uh, joined ISIS and Nusra, and they and they work together with those organizations. So, the, uh, the the makeup of these these death squad organizations are of course fundamentalists, but they they are also generally very mentally deficient. Right? These are not smart people, generally speaking. I mean, there was a the journalist who was kidnapped early on by these death squad fighters, and what she found is that most of them were uh you know morons and and i don't i'm not saying that to be rhetorical i'm just saying that, that they're not, they're incredibly um stupid people and they they couldn't read they couldn't write they couldn't understand some basic concepts and she even asked them you know you say you're you you hate the united states and israel but why are you taking money from them and their response was what are you talking about we don't take money from israel or the united states and they had they had no idea so at the bottom these people are uh, very, very low skilled to say the least, and at the top, of course, you've got the the sort of double agent, uh, al, you know, al Baghdadi type um, type figures who are actually CIA assets. I guess Anwar al Awlaki would be another example of the of that type of thing. So these uh, these these forces, of course, have been controlled by the United States for some time. We can go back to the late 1970s, where Zbigniew Brzezinski can be seen actually on on video telling the Mujahideen in Afghanistan that you know this this war is a holy war. This is your war. And when we armed them at the time, and ever since then, we have continued to use them. We try to use them to assassinate Gaddafi in the late 90s, and of course, we use them on 9/11. And, and anybody that that questions or calls you know the uh, calls it a conspiracy theory to suggest that Al Qaeda was actually a tool of the United States government should should go back and do some very basic even mainstream cursory research that will 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 show you otherwise that, that will show you will prove the fact that the United States indeed did control Al Qaeda and still does I mean that we're deploying them now we deployed them against Gaddafi in Libya. Uh, a few years ago in 2010 and even earlier well of course but, but that um, piece of footage you talk about with Brzezinski actually features uh, Osama bin Laden I believe uh, right. as well and uh, he's he's um, Brzezinski standing there with the uh, the AK-47 and, and telling them it's, it's their holy war and, and all this kind of rhetoric and of course use them against the Soviets or to, to draw the Soviets into Afghanistan uh, in the first place and um 
the you know as you say basic research that that is that is on video that's that's well known to have happened and uh, I think Brzezinski's even admitted that he's he started uh, he created Al Qaeda uh, to fight the Soviets and of course they used them again in Kosovo I believe they took a load of them over there uh, to create uh, the only Muslim state in Europe which is Kosovo right uh, in fact Brzezinski did a series of interviews where he admitted that they created Al Qaeda not to fight the Russians but to draw them in as you say so um this is all on record, and of course, the United States is is also funding you know a lot of these uh, Chechen rebels as well. But in terms of Syria, we had a, a report by Seymour Hirsch that I think some people may be familiar with, entitled "The Redirection," and it was published in the New Yorker in 2007, where Seymour Hirsch um, in, interviewed a number of uh, a number of uh, high-level people in the Middle East, and it, he, he reported that the United States was indeed funding uh, death squad uh, terrorists to overthrow the governments in Syria and a few other uh, Middle Eastern countries that were targeting Lebanon as well. We can see that, that happening in the Middle East right now as well, and also uh, attempting to, to overthrow Iran. There's, it actually goes back somewhat uh, further because there's an article in 2005 by Michael Hirsch and John Barry for Newsweek called The Salvador Option. And this is the, essentially the same uh, discussion, but where, where, where these, these uh, writers mentioned that the United States was funding death squad organizations to fight in Iraq and in Syria back in 2005. So you can imagine that if the, the mainstream reports are catching up to this in 2005 how long it had uh, been deployed before uh, you know before we we actually knew about it so um, the, the the question of the groups and and how similar they are I went through this at the beginning of the show but uh, this uh, Baghdadi is we can kind of use him as as a key because his his sort of uh, run up through the, the ranks of the terrorist organizations is kind of indicative of, of, of how the organizations themselves um, developed, right? He, he was, uh, Baghdadi is, is an Iraqi who, who had joined Al-Qaeda, the, the, you know, the big Al-Qaeda organization to fight against Saddam Hussein, as I mentioned earlier. And, and during the U.S. invasion, he sort of committed a number of atrocities against Shiites and and Christians he you know brought in Shia law uh, Sharia law and he beheaded a lot of people slaughtered a lot of people in in the public squares and uh, was actually arrested by the United States and brought to Camp Buka for uh, about four years and if, if anybody understands how these prison camps work they'll understand the fact that uh, there's only two ways to come out of a US torture camp and that is either in a body bag or as a double agent you don't get out any other way and there's there's a lot of ways that they could turn these guys into double agents whether it's just giving them the offer of their freedom for cooperation or or, or actual MK ultra style torture techniques to, to break a person's mental faculties down to, uh, to to work for them as an agent but regardless Baghdadi went in uh, in 2005, came out in 2009, so that's four years there in the torture camp. So I guess we could, that's sort of the, the, the school of terrorists. So I guess he got his four-year degree from, uh, from Camp Buka. But when he came back to Iraq, the uh, al-Qaeda in Iraq cell that he was a part of merged into the Islamic Emirate of Iraq, right? And in 2010, he was, he was named the leader of the Islamic Emirate emirate of iraq the um, the the iei then started staging operations against maliki who was the prime minister of um, of iraq and who was the gov uh, the the the, the uh, governing officer who was responsible for warming relations between iraq and iran and this was something by the way that the united states did not want to see but um the the IEI had its sister organization, again, as I mentioned, in Syria, which was called at the time Al-Nusra Front. So basically, the uh, a Baghdadi decides to unify even the two names and call it the Islamic Emirate of Iraq and the Levant, the IEIL. And that name then 
changed later to ISIL, which is Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. And then, of course, we changed it again to ISIS, Islamic State of Iraq and Sham, Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. Um, this is, you know, now it's IS, Islamic State, right? All it is is a name change. People really need to grasp this concept and stop stop buying into the, you know, day-to-day -day drama. Oh, al-Nusra is fighting with al-Qaeda, which is fighting with ISIS. It, that's a load of crap. They're not. They're not. You know, of course, there's fundamentalists at the bottom, and the nature of the fundamentalist is to, you know, disagree with one small aspect of a you know religious tenet and then to try to kill its opponent so there is of course some fighting that's going on uh, a number of them are killing each other that's again the nature of fundamentalism but you know as a whole these groups are not fighting with one another they are working together and you can see that with the fact that the united states is arming these so-called moderate rebels who are who, who turn out to be as i you know mentioned with the Free Syrian Army, just as bad as ISIS. There's no difference between the two, but because of a cleverly worked public relations campaign, there you know, is this idea that some are moderate rebels. Well, they're given weapons. The United States gives them TAL missiles. They give them uh, small arms. They give them a number of different types of, of aid. And what happens? ISIS marches to fight the um, you know, uh, Harakat Hazam brigade and Harakat Hazam just walks away and they leave their weapons conveniently and ISIS comes in and takes them. So in other words all of, all of this is just a, a, a propaganda narrative to get us to believe that there are you know civil wars between the death squads and moderates and extremists but there's not. It's, it's only a few name changes that allow you know the, the US government and NATO to say that we give weapons to moderate rebels but not to extremists but in the end we're giving them to the extremists and that's what people need to understand that the United States is not trying to defeat ISIS it doesn't want to defeat ISIS why would it it controls ISIS and uh, you know again that's the important uh, you know part of, of what I'm trying to say here yeah well of course uh, even uh, the, the British Army the American Army uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, they, they left a lot of equipment out there worth uh, like millions and millions of dollars and pounds uh, for anybody to, to get a hold of. Uh, now, if you if you wanted to uh, to start a, a conflict, um, the first thing you do is arm people, and uh, the, I guess the easiest way to do it is to to go over there, invade the place, cause mayhem, and leave all the, the heavy armor and everything there for them to use when you've gone. Um, and that's exactly what they did. And uh, who knows who who got what. Uh, kind of military equipment um, but go, going back to the um, atrocities for, for want of a better word um, before myself and Paula came back from the UK to the States uh, I visited a couple of my friends in a place called Basingbourne in uh, Cambridgeshire and uh, we're changing countries but it's the same scenario uh, and they were training Libyan troops there and we were told this by the guy behind the bar uh, that these troops were being trained at the, the army base up the road and then of course the it, it turned out that um, some of these guys, uh, they, they called them cadets, which was uh, strange in the first, the first place because uh, a couple of these guys were in their 30s and uh, late 20s, uh, so they certainly weren't cadets, uh, they, were, they were grown men. Um, but they, they, they decided to uh, close that training program uh, just recently and send the, all these guys home, 2,000 of them. Um, because they've been out in the streets raping people and uh, assaulting people and stuff like that, so uh, it makes you wonder what they were training them to do. You know, and you, as you mentioned, they're not the most intelligent of people, and uh, if they've got those kind of people in there, and as you say, maybe it's MK Ultra techniques or, or whatever, uh, are they actually training them to go back and commit atrocities? Yeah, I, I don't doubt that they're doing that at all, and and, and of course it. It strikes fear into the uh, you know, the hearts of your your enemies to do this to, to to commit an atrocity and and videotape it. But yeah, I mean the the British government is is involved in this every much as the ever ever so much as the United States government is. In fact, you can't really separate the two on a lot of a lot of uh, issues. But uh, yeah, there's a lot more I could say about that too, I guess. But the the um, the bombing of ISIS, I wanted to mention this too, because a lot of people are going to respond, well, if the United States doesn't want to destroy ISIS and defeat ISIS, why is the United States bombing ISIS? And my response to that would be, they're not. Uh, you know, I've done a series of articles about this, and despite the, you know, 
mainstream media reports of the United States airstrikes, look at what they've actually bombed. You can you can see that all they've done is bomb Syrian infrastructure. They've bombed the oil refineries, the oil rigs. They've bombed grain silos. That was another that they came in and they targeted grain silos. And they're going to complain that there's a humanitarian um, issue and they'll pro- blame Assad for that. But they bombed the grain silos. That doesn't belong to ISIS. ISIS didn't build them either. And you look at what they've struck in Iraq. They were striking ISIS. This is probably one of the few uh, instances where the United States actually did bomb ISIS, and that was in Erbil. That's because that's where a lot of Western major or international oil companies have their headquarters in the Kurdish areas there. and they have It's, it's an extremely oil-rich area, so you don't want ISIS to veer off the path or get off the reservation and overtake those oil rigs. That's, uh, that's for the big boys. In fact, that was actually that bombing. That if you, you know, you're, it's amazing what you can figure out just by using a map. And we had this situation where um, the uh, Iraqi uh, Yazidis were trapped on Mount Sinjar from the uh, the death squads there at the bottom of the mountain, and it was blasted across mainstream media that these people were about to either they were either going to starve to death on the mountain or they were going to be chopped to pieces by ISIS at the bottom. And the United States had to come in and engage in airstrikes to save them. So that's what they did. The United States engaged in airstrikes in Erbil, not in Mount Sinjar. Right? The, the Yazidis were saved by, by Syrian Kurds and Iraqi Kurds, not by the U.S. Marines. But to all intents and, for all intents and purposes, the average American read those reports and said, oh, good, the United States is doing something about this. Well, the truth is Erbil's on the other side of the country, and Erbil is where the, the oil uh, infrastructure is for the international oil companies. So that's, you know, that's just another example of the propaganda narrative. The United States is not bombing ISIS. Uh, again, look at uh, Kobani. The, uh, the the small town that has been in the news for for so many weeks in in Syria, right on the Turkish border. The real the Arabic name is Ain al Arab, which means uh, Arab Spring, interestingly enough. And uh, Kobani is the Kurdish name, which is being used in in all of the media reports. But um, the Kurds are are trying to fight off this this major force of of ISIS fighters. And the United States has been relentlessly bombing Kobani for the last few weeks. But with all the force that the United States has been pouring into Kobani, nothing seems to happen. The, the ISIS fighters continue to, uh, to mount an offensive, to continue to, to, to make gains in Kobani. It, it's, very, it's very interesting to me that if by now this place should have been ob- obliterated, but ISIS forces have remained intact. So this tells me, and, and with a lot, a lot of the other information that I've talked about, that the United States is not uh, targeting ISIS fighters at all, and, and that is just nothing more than propaganda. It's an excuse to justify military action in Syria. Um, <laughs> you know, this is funny, too. When you, when you talk about, when we were talking about the airports earlier on, you were talking about playing the odds. The... Uh, I don't know if the ISIS fighters are, you know, are just the most unlucky terrorists in the world, um, the the wily e. coyote version of of international terrorism, because everything they've done in the last few months has done nothing but encourage the American people to support U.S. military invasion. Right? But when the United States was talking about airstrikes, we had an American journalist, James Foley, beheaded. The British people weren't too keen on on, on joining into the bombing, and then conveniently, uh, there was a British journalist beheaded. And so the French still dilly-dallied around in terms of whether or not they were going to engage in bombing inside Syria, and then a Frenchman was beheaded, and then, then the French jumped on board. So the United States is talking about flying over across Syria and engaging in airstrikes, but they're worried about the Syrian air defenses uh, across the country and what happens but ISIS overtakes the Takba Air Force Base in the eastern part of Syria and eliminates all the air defenses in the eastern part of Syria so well what do you know all that that problem's been eliminated and lastly the the United States uh, you know wants to impose a no-fly zone and so even 
people in Congress started to speak up and say, well, wait a minute, why are we imposing a no-fly zone? ISIS doesn't have an air force. And what happens? ISIS gets an air force. ISIS captures planes in eastern Syria, and there's a alleged video showing these planes being flown. So now that's the justification for a no-fly zone. I, I think, you know, hopefully people are seeing how this, this works, right? Every time there's a need for a propaganda effort, ISIS terrorists are right there to provide what was, uh, what was needed to justify uh, what, what the NATO countries want to do. Yeah, I, it's, I mean, I don't know if it's uh, the unluckiest terrorist in the world, but certainly the most stupid. Um, if, if you want to, if you want to bring the the might of the American military down on your head, uh, you, you don't incite it, do you? You don't you don't go out and do things that are going to encourage it, and you certainly don't. Um, you want to demoralise the, the American people so they don't want a war. Uh, you certainly don't uh, do things and, and videotape them. And, and send them out over the internet so that the American people get get behind the government to to facilitate uh, troops on the ground or or more airstrikes or or whatever it is. Um, so as you say, I mean, you know, unlucky or or downright stupid. Uh, it's one or the other, isn't it? And um, getting getting down to the, the bottom of your article, and it, the same thing's going on in the UK. Uh, talk of troops getting sent back to Iraq now. Uh, and what are these troops going to be used for? I mean. We can't get them from the air. I mean, do, do they think that sending a few guys with uh, a few hands handguns is going to solve the problem? Yeah, you know exactly. And and of course, we just recently had this new uh, beheading. This uh, Peter Kessig, who who was beheaded in uh, in Syria, and this I, you know who knows what this is leading up to uh, now. But you know, I would just point out that. The video itself is about 15 minutes long, and the overwhelming majority of the video is just some, you know, uh, you know, propaganda effects, you know, of uh, soldiers marching. It's all, uh, you know, just elaborate stuff. And then you get to the part uh, where, where there's actual atrocities being committed, and there were 18 Syrian soldiers who were beheaded. N those guys weren't mentioned in mainstream reports, except you know, as a as a background. Narrative. Uh, there were 18 Syrian soldiers, and then poor Peter Kasich. Um, you know, I, I guess he he counts more than they do. But the the part of of Kasich's beheading is not shown. It, all is, that is shown is the uh, jihadist who is narrating the video standing next to a severed human head, and they he claims that it's the head of of Peter Kasich. So I've looked at these these videos. Um, James Foley beheading for one. And it's fake. I don't. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that James Foley is alive. I don't know that. But what I will say is the clip that I saw on the James Foley beheading was fake. I've seen beheadings. This was not one, right? Um, we can go into reason why if you want. I, you know, we could do that. But it's just uh, they weren't real. And now for this video to come out and and just have a human head on the ground and take uh, take the jihadist word for it. You know, considering the fact of what these you know Western-backed terrorists have done since their uh, you know intervention in Syria, I would imagine a human head is pretty easy to find. I mean, they just chopped off 18 of them. I mean, how do we know it wasn't one of theirs? Uh, so, I don't believe this uh, this propaganda video either. And I would also point out that uh, Peter Kasig is uh, the founder of a so-called aid organization, Special Emergency Response Team or, or something, uh, or Special Emergency Response Initiative. I could get you the, the actual name of that organization, but this organization takes money from Conscience International, which is another non-governmental organization, which itself takes money from the National Endowment for Democracy. Now, that might sound a little bit like uh, like drawing too many connections, but actually it's not when you understand how these NGOs work, right? You have a larger NGO that funnels money to a smaller NGO that funnels money to the actual NGOs that are there on the ground in these countries. And the, the NED, the National Endowment for Democracy, has been, um, you know, one of the main uh, sources of staging and funding color revolutions in Eastern Europe and the Middle East. It's well known for this. It has uh, two tentacles, one being the uh, International Republican Institute, which is sort of the Republican uh, conservative 
wing of the NED and then the National Democratic Institute, which applies to the Democrats and liberal side of things. John McCain is the chairman of the IRI, and of course John McCain is good friends with these terrorists. But I, again, I just I only say that to point out that Kasich has connections to uh, the NED through the Conscience International Organization. And I found some interviews in this article. The article is The Beheading That Never Was, The Kasich Killing and Western War Propaganda, if people want to check that out. But you know, the, the interview that uh, Kasich did before a couple of years ago, before obviously this, this situation today, and he expressed some sympathies with the death squad fighters that you know the the idea was that his choices were between giving out medicine to people or picking up a gun and fighting with the rebels and of course that's not if you're if you're you know concerned about bringing peace and stability to the Syrian people those are not your your only option so sky obviously had sympathies with the death squads he had connections to organizations that were funding the death squads so uh, whether he's alive or not, I can't say, but in terms of this propaganda video, I can say that I believe that that is fake. Well, the, the thing that struck me about uh, these videos was that uh, you always had some guy standing there with uh, a knife in his hand, which is, I don't know, six, eight inches long, and uh, my first thought was you can't cut a head off with that. Um, you know, a neck's a pretty tough thing, and there's a, a spinal cord to go through a, a, a spine. You know, you just can't cut it off with something that looks like a bread knife. Um but uh, anyway, uh, well, I, I would just say that you know maybe they could they could get the head off. I mean, I think that, you know they they tend to take their time with these things, if, if, you know, if it if need be. But if you watch the video with Foley, you'll see the uh, the knife go across the throat about six to nine times. Right? I don't care how dull that knife is. There's going to be blood at some point there was no blood you can slow it down and count the amount of times that knife goes back and forth and there's no blood period so that's fake i mean whether he's beheaded after the fact i don't know but what we saw in the video sure was the beheading yeah and as i say why would you why would you video something like that if you you know if, if you, unless you want to be attacked you know unless right. you want to to incite uh, further uh, intervention by so-called Western forces. Uh, okay, um, we've got another piece of music and then we'll come back. You're listening to Awake Radio. Straight talk for the awake and aware. Bates Radio, uh, second hour of tonight's broadcast, uh, for the guest Brandon Turberville. Now we've done uh, Syria, ISIS and uh, all the atrocities going on over there, but uh, there's another atrocity happening in New York it seems, and that's uh, gun confiscation. Now uh, people in the UK um, won't have any idea about gun confiscation because it's, it's so long ago that we had ours taken off of us. Uh, the only people in the UK now allowed guns, it seems, are criminals, uh, police officers and farmers. Uh, and uh, they're, they're going after the farmers' guns as well now. Uh, so, uh, Brandon, gun confiscation begins in New York via dead family members. And this is a tactic they use over here as well, which uh, I'll come on to in terms of uh, knives in a minute. But uh, we'll start with gun confiscation in New York. Yeah, well, what's happening there is they, they have something in New York State called the SAFE Act. And essentially, the, the you know this is this is totalitarian gun grabbing. If if you have ever wanted to witness it, this is where you can look. Uh, New York City is probably the worst, and then there's uh, New York State, which is unfortunately beholden to a lot of the policies coming out of New York City. But uh, most of the people in Western New York are are uh, very favorable to gun rights. But you know that's that's beside the point. The idea here in New York State, because of the Safe Act, is that you've got to have um, a permit to own a pistol, right? And if an individual has a permit and has the permission of their government to have a, a, a pistol, and the person dies, then there is a period of time where that weapon has to either be turned into the proper authorities, or it has to be sold back to a dealer or it has to be transferred the permit has to be transferred 
and some of these these um, uh, you know authorities are giving family members about two weeks to uh, to do all of that right so the idea is if you know your father dies or your mother dies in the midst of planning the funeral and getting everything the estate in order the thing that you have to do immediately is get that gun uh, re-registered somehow and and transferred back uh, back to you or or, or to the um, gun dealers and you know it's it's something that has not largely been enforced but recently it was announced by the buffalo city police that they're actually going to start going out and checking up and and confiscating those weapons so if they'll, they'll go look through the permit registry because you know we're we're told in the US and the you know the the, the gun uh grabbing debate the, the the gun control debate we're told registration does not uh, lead to confiscation. Well, <laughs> it does here and it does everywhere else because what they're doing is they're looking at the registries and then they're going out and checking the um, the people who have these permits. And if the person is dead, they're tracking the gun down. They're going to confiscate it. So we had um, uh, a, a report that they're, they're saying that they're, they're afraid that families are holding on to weapons even after the person who bought them originally is dead. So they're, they're going out and, and looking for them. So um, if anybody doubts whether or not this is confiscation, there is the uh, quote from, uh, I'll just read this couple sentences, from Daniel Dorinda, who is the police commissioner in uh, Buffalo. He says, this is a direct quote, he says, We recently started a program where we're cross-referencing all the pistol permit holders with the death records, and we're sending people out to collect the guns whenever possible so that they don't end up in the wrong hands. Because at times these uh, they, they lay out there and the family is not aware of them and they end up just out on the street. And that's the end of the quote. Now I don't, I don't know how they end up out on the street. The family is not aware of them, but um, there you go. So that's what they're doing in New York. They're they're allowing 15 days after the death of a family member, and then they're going to show up at your door and demand the gun. And uh, you know, I don't have any doubt that the you know the police uh, stormtroopers of the Buffalo City Police will come in and do whatever they have to do to get those guns away from the uh, the, the citizens who you know who who rightly you know have a right to own them so i've got no doubt that the people are going to give them up either and, and i've got no doubt that nobody's going to come to uh, to make a big stand I, I said in the article that, that we're referencing here is that i don't have any expectation of all of these people who who constantly talk so loud and, and say things like they, you know they wouldn't take my guns or they wouldn't do that here well yeah I, I, I have no expectations that these people will will do anything but talk you know we we had that you know a situation in Bunkerville Nevada where you know uh, Clive and Bundy or I'm gonna call him Cloven Bundy I, I don't I think that was not a good idea to rally around but people showed up from all across the country to rally around this guy's rights, which he didn't even have, but now people are going to have their guns confiscated in New York, and I, I bet we won't see any action to um, to stand up for gun rights there. So, this is my little two cents on that. Yeah, I, I read through this article, and that that sentence struck me as well, the one you mentioned there, because at times they they lay out there, and the family is not aware of them, and they end up just out in the street. And I, I thought, well, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. How do they end up in the street? Are they just throwing them out in the trash? I mean, you know, how do they? <laughs> does somebody just throw it out the window? I mean, it's just crazy. Well, but, we'll uh, see. <laughs> we'll see, Neil. Guns are very uh, temperamental creatures, and when they're not given attention, they get up and they just walk right out the door. Yeah, into the wrong hands, apparently. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> um, the, I mean, the the fact that they're, they're using um, bereavement to be, to basically knock on somebody's door, and even if the funeral and all the arrangements are, are dealt with, uh, the last thing somebody wants is a couple of uh, heavily armed police officers knocking on the door saying, "Give me your guns." They're just going to they're just going to hand them over to get to get rid of them, to get rid of the police officers. I mean, uh, that, that unless unless they're kind of uh, so distraught that they might um, react uh, differently. Uh, in which case they may find themselves shot um, because they, they refuse to hand them over and uh, possibly get a bit uh, upset, as they've ever right to do. Yeah, and we've seen this in, in the U.S. before, right, the um, disarming of populations. In, in the article that I've done, there's a video of 
of confiscation in in New Orleans. And it's for anybody who, you know, I, I live in, in in the South, and uh, you you hear stories about something in New York or Maryland or Boston, and you know. California and everybody kind of laughs and they say you know because you know this, this the, these places are you know cesspits and and people will you know no offense to the people who live there but it's a cesspit and you know people down here will say well they might do that in California they might do that in Connecticut but they won't do that in South Carolina and they won't do that in Alabama well you know Louisiana is pretty far south and it's pretty big on its gun rights and they did that in Louisiana they came through and they went door to door and they took guns and you know what people did they gave them up and i think that unfortunately is what people will do today because people have you know especially on the internet they have this ability to talk tough and say i wouldn't do this i wouldn't do that i would stand up and fight but they don't and they don't because they don't have to and they don't go defend their uh, their neighbors or their friends or their fellow activists and then when when it comes around to them because the fact is it will come around to them right they will do this in New York and in Connecticut and California first and then they'll move on to other states uh, then they'll move on to uh, the, the states uh, you know that they'll, they'll go from Maryland and New York to Indiana or uh, you know Ohio and then they'll move to South Carolina and Texas and as long as they do it incrementally people never actually put up a fight that's unfortunate yeah well I think uh, those videos from um, New Orleans with the, the troops on the streets um, I mean these guys were, were pointing automatic weapons into people's living rooms uh, I, I don't think anybody's going to say hold on a minute you're not getting me gun because these guys will just shoot you I mean, they're not going to take any prisoners and they're not going to risk uh, being shot themselves yeah and in fact toward the end of that video in the article you can see there's this uh, National Guard soldier who was asked by a reporter would he shoot American citizens uh, or essentially asked would he shoot American citizens, uh, citizens? and he said yes and uh, you know <laughs> just take a look at what we've uh, what we've allowed to to appear here it, it, this, is, this happened years ago and you can see the the police and you can't really tell the difference between the police and the military. Yeah, well, that uh, that young, um, I think it was a National Guardsman, was he? Um, I think he was asked a question, you know, what, how do you feel about this? And he says, well, it's, it's, it's uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but he, he termed it as if uh, he was just thinking about what he might have to do in the future. And that's, that's when he asked the question about uh, shooting Americans. And he said, yes. I mean, the, the, they're obviously training these guys to do that. Uh, because I mean, I'd, I'd imagine... Um, 30, 40 years ago, that would be unthinkable for an American soldier to be walking down the street thinking about shooting an American citizen. Yeah, and and you know, there I did an article a while back. I actually broke the story. It was it was about the FBI counterterrorism units who were visiting South Carolina gun shops, and I had a source who um, we'll say witnessed the exchange, where the FBI counterterrorism officer came into a gun store and and passed out a flyer that you know with this contact information in it and wanted the uh, the individuals in the gun store to report any suspicious activity and the suspicious activity was not islamic fundamentalism it was sovereign citizens anti-government rhetoric or even just people who complain about big governments i mean that could be like republicans right so this is the this is the information they were looking for at a gun shop here in South Carolina, you know, because it wouldn't happen here in South Carolina, but uh, you know, it, it's happening all across the country. Well, uh, there was a the definition of terrorism in Britain was uh, anybody who spoke out against government, and uh, that immediately put all the opposition parties uh, labelled as terrorists. But uh, nobody seemed to get that. Yeah, um, and David Cameron now has the new definition of non-violent <laughs> terrorism, right? Um, okay, I mean, this for people in uh, in America. I mean, I'm I'm from Scotland. Uh, I lived in the UK most of my life. The brief spells over in uh, Turkey, Bulgaria, England, uh, Wales, Ireland, and uh, it doesn't stop at guns. Uh, and uh, just last week, was it? Yeah, last week in the UK, uh, Lancashire Constabulary, that's a police force in Lancashire, north of England, uh, has joined forces with a groundbreaking national anti-knife crime campaign, Save a Life, Surrender Your Knife, as the force's knife amnesty comes to an end. So it's just finished, but this is this is a trial balloon uh, 
kind of thing, but it's, it's a national thing. So they, they've trialled it, and now, as you say, it's, it's going to move on to, to another area of the UK where they'll do it. And they'll keep raking in these knives. And uh, as is well known in the UK, and I'm sure the same in America and, and every other country, uh, most uh, stabbings happen in people's houses uh, with uh, domestic kitchen appliances. So I, I don't know what uh, good this is ever going to do. Uh, if somebody wants to stab somebody, they'll just take a knife out of the kitchen drawer and they'll, they'll go off with it and, and do something with it. They don't have to buy a, a Bowie knife from the local hardware shop or anything. Um, but it, it doesn't even stop there. I, I, I don't know. If, do, do they have um, anti-knife campaigns in the U.S.? I haven't heard of any anti-knife campaigns in the U.S., although we do have knife laws. We, we do have laws against automatic knives, right? If you have switch blades, are illegal in most places. Yeah, we, we have that that rule as well. I think uh, nobody's allowed to carry a, a blade that's over four inches long. Yeah. Well, and uh, if you, even if, even if you have, um, what they call them box cutters in America, they call them Stanley knives in, in uh, the UK, uh, you're not even allowed to carry one of them unless you can prove that you're, it's actually for work. You know? Um, <laughs> it's just, and any, like a pen knife, even a pen knife, if it, the blade is longer than uh, four inches, I think it is, you have to um, have some plausible reason for carrying it. Um, you're not just allowed to whittle sticks or, uh, you know, peel an apple or anything anymore. Um, but it doesn't even stop there. Uh, now they're going to go after our dogs. So the, the guns went a long, long time ago, and uh, we spoke off air, uh, going back hundreds of years. Uh, the Scots, the Irish were all disarmed. Uh, they weren't allowed to carry swords, knives, anything. Um even even now, uh, traditionally when you get married in Scotland, you wear a kilt, and you used to be allowed to have what they call the skin do, which is like a black knife, and it, it went down your sock, and that was the blade was possibly I don't know five six inches sometimes. Uh, you're not even allowed them anymore at weddings because apparently too many people were being stabbed at weddings. But <laughs> that's, maybe that's something to do with it. The amount of alcohol people are consuming and not really the knives in the first place. It's the people again. It's it's not uh, guns that kill people. It's people that kill people, uh, and control the guns and the knives. But uh, they're going after our dogs now, and um, dogs in England. This is just England. So the trial in England, uh, you got Scotland and Wales to go as well. Maybe the supplies to Wales as well because it generally does. Uh, if England gets it, Wales gets it as well. Uh, but every dog owner in England will have to microchip their animal from 2016 under plans intended to cut a rise in stray dogs. Uh, any excuse will do, any excuse. But um, it's, it's, basically, it's obviously they, they want to get your dog off you because um, I would imagine that the, the majority of people in Britain who own dogs are not wealthy people. Uh, and uh, if your dog isn't microchipped, you're going to face a fine of up to £500. Which is quite a lot. It's, uh, what's that about? It's nearly eight hundred dollars. So mm -hmm. um, we're not even going to have a dog to protect us anymore. So I mean, they, they, they would obviously you're still going to have kitchen knives. So I, I don't see how that's going to help anybody. Um, but I, I mean, a dog in the UK where where you know burglaries are, are rampant because uh, nobody's got the means to defend themselves apart from their kitchen knives, I guess. Um, and uh, I was asked when I was coming over to the States, I said, what, what are you going to do over there? It's, it's, you know, there's all this violence and all the rest of it. I says, and I said, hey, they've got guns over there. I says, what have you got in the UK to protect yourself? Nothing. You know, I said, they're going after your knives, your dogs, everything. Uh, is it, and I said, I said to you up there, uh, is it going to come to the point where we go to the, the local kitchen shop and all you can buy is plastic cutlery? Well, probably so, eventually. Um you know, I, I have no doubt that they'll go after the kitchen knives eventually because, as you said, you know, so many people get stabbed at home. So I guess they'll be using that, uh, you know, probably using that as an excuse to take children next. Well, yeah, you, you've got dangerous weapons in the house. Uh, you, ha you have a, a bread knife there, uh, which a child could possibly harm themselves with if you leave them alone to cut up a, a loaf of bread. Um, but the, the issue of the dogs, I mean, Britain is... is possibly, you know, world known for being a nation of dog lovers, as it were. And and in times of, uh, well, recession, depression, call it what you will, um, there are a lot of people getting pretty desperate and uh, they will break into your house for, for anything that they can sell, uh, whether it's for drugs or, or simply to, to eat, you know. And to take people's dogs off them uh, is, 
I, I don't know. I'm not quite sure how how the UK people all all tolerate it. It's just it seems quite bizarre. But you read down this article and they say it's costing the um, taxpayer fifty seven million pounds a year uh, because of stray dogs apparently. Uh, but they say it's uh, about a hundred thousand dogs are dumped or lost each year at a cost of fifty seven million. That that works out at five hundred and seventy pound a dog. Uh, I I don't know what kind of uh, you know, programs they got in place, but that seems an awful lot of money to, to re- rehome a dog. Um, because it says here that um, half of them are returned to the owner. How can that cost £570? You know, but um, maybe they're just not making enough money out of it or something. And uh, you know, I suppose, as I say, poor people are not going to um, go and microchip their dog because there'll be a cost impl- implied in that as well. Uh, I'm sure that'll be £100 or something. And uh, they're going to be fined 500 so the dogs are going to go. Um, so if anybody in America wants to know where gun confiscation leads, this is how ridiculous it gets. You know, we're also getting the the, the propaganda campaigns, though, about microchip, uh, microchipping animals. We've been getting that for a few years. Right now it's still in the... Uh, the in, in, you know encouragement phase because it's still sort of snob appeal, right? You have your animal chipped and you won't ever lose your animal. So right now we're still being encouraged to do it by propaganda. But uh, I, you know, again, eventually you'll we'll, we'll get the we'll get the mandates as well. A lot of the human, uh, humane societies already chip them and won't let animals go without being chipped. So if you're if you're looking for a rescue animal, that's already been done. Well, that, that happens in the UK. Uh, if you buy an animal from a, an animal welfare centre, it, it is chipped already. And, um, I mean, there's, there's many, many articles out there showing that uh, these microchips are causing cancer in their pets. And these, these are not just from alternative media sites. They're from, um, you know, uh, dog owner sites. And uh, there's one site, uh, Dogs Naturally, a magazine for dogs without boundaries, as if the dog can read it. But, uh, maybe you can with a microchip. Maybe it's a microchip in the brain that makes them super intelligent. They can actually read English or a variety of languages. Who knows? But um, I mean, even even uh, vet, veterinarian sites are saying that these chips cause cancer in, in the animals. So again, it's a, it's a no-win situation. If you're a dog owner, you're going to be fined five hundred um, pounds for not chipping, or your dog's going to be dead in a couple of years anyway. Uh, so that's it. But of course, uh, you mentioned propaganda about it, and of, of course, this is this is uh, it's only a short step towards um, human microchipping. I mean, are you going to be allowed to take your baby out of the hospital unless it's microchips? You know, and if you don't microchip your baby, are you going to be fined a thousand pounds? Or, I mean, how ridiculous is it going to get? Yeah, and, and as I said to you in the break, I mean, here in the United States, we we used to joke about the English, you know, gun laws, and we'd say. You know, what's next? Are they going to start banning knives? And now they're trying. And you know, I was I was joking with you in the break, and I said this is ruined comedy for me uh, because now I can't make jokes about absurd the absurdity of these things because it it's it's true. It's the absurdity. The jokes are now reality. It's not jokes anymore. And people can look. And this is the same uh, thing that I was talking about in terms of. What, what some people do in certain parts of the country, you know, look at New York or California and kind of laugh and say, oh, well, look at those places. Of, well, of course it'll go there. Every, every bad oppressive law passes in New York and California as if it won't come around to them. And it will come around to them. It always comes around to them. And by then you've laughed at other people and ignored the, uh, the, the plight of other people to the point that nobody has any interest in standing up for you. So that, you know, that that's the... The, the direction that it always leads. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's the, the, the scenario of uh, first I came for the Jews, you know, and I said yeah. nothing. Uh, and that's where it's going. Um, but um, we'll go to another piece of music and then we'll come back and we'll talk about uh, feeding the homeless because that's another thing that's happening in the UK as well, uh, where they're, they're banning that. And uh, I see you have an article up there about the, the very same thing and it uh, applies to veterans. So uh, we'll go to a piece of music and uh, we'll come back and discuss that for the, the last 20 minutes oh, or so. Truther, oh, truther, wherefore out thou, truther, deny thy propaganda and refuse thy lie, or if thou wilt not be but sworn, my love, and I'll no longer be a slave. Shall I hear more, or shall I speak at this? Tis but thy tyrannic minds that is thine enemy. Thou art thyself, though not an illusion. What is an illusion? It is nor hand, nor foot, no arm, nor face, nor any other part belonging to a man. O oh, be some other wisdom. What is in truth? 
that which we call a false flag, by any other word we be propaganda thy truth, so truth or would, were he not truth or called, retain that dear perfection which he owes without that title, truth speak thy mind, and ask for thy soul, which is true part of thee, take all myself. You're tuned into Awake Radio, romancing the truth to unite a world with inseparable love. AwakeRadio.us, AwakeRadio.co.uk Okay, welcome back to the last uh, 15 minutes or so with Brandon Turberville, our guest today. And uh, we're going to discuss um, feeding the, the homeless, as it were. But uh, in the case of this uh, article he's got up on his site, brandontumberville.com, it's uh, War is a Racket. Uh, Thank a veteran, but don't feed one. And the, the, the picture you've got in the article is uh, good. I like it. It's a picture of the back of an SUV with an American flag on it and uh, a support a troops sticker. And the guy standing at the side of the road with his crutch on uh, with a, a placard saying homeless vet and uh, the driver saying get a life, you worthless bum. And uh, we were talking off air about whether the troops coming back from Iraq and uh, Afghanistan and, and well, shortly, <laughs> shortly Syria and uh, no doubt. Um, are getting treated any differently than the guys did when they came back from Vietnam. Um, wh what would you say to that? Well, I, I don't think they are getting treated any different, except that we, we now tell these guys, thank you for your service, and that makes us feel nice, warm, and cuddly inside like we've done something. And, and uh, we, you know, we can move on and, and, and forget about them. And the difference in Vietnam is that people didn't really have that clever saying or not one that I know of anyway. So to, to me, I don't see that we're treating them any differently. Uh, they still get substandard care. They still get, um, you know, a, a few extra little perks here and there, but largely ignored when it comes to their uh, the, their injuries and the, the mental illness that, that comes from combat and and so forth. So, And, it, and also the fact that, uh, you know, veterans have a much higher suicide rate and that veterans have a, a very high rate of homelessness, which is ignored um, largely, unless we have a, you know, foundation that's trying to collect money under, under their guise. But, uh, yeah, I don't think they're really being treated any differently, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, there's, there are, I think there's, there's more soldiers actually in service still committing suicide more than um, soldiers who've been killed in combat. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, well, it, it doesn't stop there. As you say, one, once they're out of the service, there's a high rate of suicide as well. So, that, I mean, that figure must be, you know, far higher in terms of suicide to, to death in combat. And, um, you know, you got to feel for these guys. I mean, as you say, that they've suffered uh, not just um, the physical injuries. Some of them possibly don't have any physical injuries, but uh, certainly they're going to have the the um, mental trauma, uh, what they've witnessed and uh, what they've done themselves. And, they, and, and of course, uh, a lot of guilt associated with that as well. I'd imagine. Yeah, and, and you know, you know, part of the the article was really kind of th that we were talking about was kind of in two parts because the first part was you know th this this phrase thank you for your service really irks me. It really drives me up the wall because I think it's incredibly stupid and it's incredibly um, empty as well. Uh, I, I personally will never say it because, uh, you know, first of all, what is the service being performed? Well, I'm not, you know, as much as I feel for war veterans and military veterans, I will not thank somebody from going over to Iraq and killing somebody just like me. I, I, I will not thank you for that. Um, that that is not a service to me. That is a service to a bank, to a corporation, and and to some uh, you know world oligarchy. So uh, no thanks for that. But it's also very empty because again, as I as I said, people will say thank you for your service as if they've they've just checked off the box and signed all the the documents that they need to sign and they've they've done everything they need to do and paid their debts. Um, to each veteran. If I say I, I thank you for your service, then my obligation is finished. Now you can go off to the street corner and starve to death. I thank you for your service and that's all there is to it. And that's why I think it's so empty because we can continue to push and allow for wars and send these these uh, uh, a lot of them kids over to go get killed and then when they come back the answer is well sorry about your legs but thank you for your service. You know or you know your 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 health care needs uh, aren't going to be met but thank you for your service it's just empty it's weak um 
I, 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 that's another reason I won't engage in that saying. But you know, all across the country, and it's, it's just funny. I wrote this article on Veterans Day to point out that uh, with, with veterans that have such a high rate of homelessness, there are cities all across the country that are banning feeding homeless people. Now, again, that's another thing that you could years ago you could have joked about, right? What's next? Is the government going to ban feeding the homeless? Well, they've done that, right? Myrtle Beach, not far away from where I'm at, um, has actually charged a person for feeding homeless people. In fact, uh, he was feeding them in the park, and they, they told him that he, he couldn't do that anymore. So he moved the uh, homeless, uh, you know, the, the feeding uh, session out to a church that volunteered. And then they came out and told the church they couldn't do it because of um, regulations, uh, you know, uh, food safety regulations. So the guy started doing it at his house on his private property, inviting people over as guests, and he was actually charged and fined for that. We've also got uh, Orlando. We've got a number of other cities across the country. I can't mention them all. But you know, we, we, there's a a 90 year old man who's been arrested three times just for feeding the homeless. I mean, you can get arrested for feeding homeless people, and that's that's one of the most basic expressions of humanity, right? To, to feed someone who's hungry, and now that is is criminalized, and there's no outcry, uh, or if there is an outcry, it's in maybe a few activist communities, but nobody is horrified at this. Um, you know, we're not standing up as a society and saying, you know, you've gone too far. We're uh, we're abiding by the laws, and th- that's that's a problem. That's that's a real problem in uh, our culture. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a, a saying that um, bad laws should be ignored, and uh, this is obviously a bad law. And the the case of the 90 year old man, I read it on air uh, a couple of weeks ago when it first came out, and uh, he's actually a World War II veteran himself. And uh, he was out in Fort Lauderdale, and as you say, he was he was arrested. And I think you're correct. As soon as his third time, I think he'd been arrested. But uh, yeah, a 90 year old man, uh, twice. Yeah, it says here twice. So I presume this was the third time. Um, he he wasn't quite arrested, but the the I mean, police officers, armed police officers, are going up to a 90 year old World War Two veteran, and there can't, there can't be many of those left. Uh, and he's he's simply uh, feeding, as you say. Uh, poor homeless people, possibly um, homeless veterans from the Iraq war, the Afghanistan war, and uh, that's that's supposedly criminal. Well, it's it's that's in, inhumane to stop people doing that. It's uh, and that's that's where the criminality is. Uh, and if police officers can't understand that, then there's something uh, terribly wrong with the police officers, because the same thing has been done in the UK. And it, I mean, again, you know, people say oh, it's a conspiracy theory, but. Uh, it's not coincidental that this is happening right across the world in the well, so-called Western uh, civilized society, um, where you're not allowed to feed homeless people. Uh, it's no coincidence that it's happening at the same time. Yeah, and what's you know again, I went on to the uh, the issue of homelessness because you know the article it was Veterans Day and the veteran uh, community has so much um, rate, so many rates of homelessness. And what what's so ironic is that. Orlando, Myrtle Beach, these other cities that are enforcing these laws or you know preventing people from feeding homeless people. These same these same cities will organize Veterans Day parades and have these ridiculous floats and all these you know big fly, flag waving ceremonies and thanking veterans for their service and then go out and arrest someone who's trying to feed them. And that, that's that's not ironic. I guess what to me, you know, obviously it bothers me to see laws like this getting passed what bothers me even more is that there's not a massive resistance to it is that people will see it and say oh it's illegal to feed homeless people i better not disobey the law or not feed the homeless people you know that I, I think that's what bothers me much more is the fact that people just acclimate to it and acquiesce to it and this this should just be you know a knee-jerk reaction should make you want to resist it and uh and and ignore the law and go out and violate it. So I openly encourage people to violate this law. Well, uh, people whenever I want. Yeah, well, I totally agree with you, and I've I've said it on air many times. You know, people people complain about uh, getting speeding tickets or or you know things like that. And I said the simple solution is you take off your registration number because that's that's the only way they get you. you know, everybody takes off the registration number; their cameras are useless. 
you know, <laughs> and and they ain't going to make any money out of them. So they they ain't going to be able to pay people to service them or or to administer the fines because uh, there will be no fines, and the computers will be useless as well, and all things like that. Just just start saying no to it. I mean, if if somebody bans feeding the homeless, then a thousand people or two thousand people need to get out and start feeding the homeless. And just totally ignore it, and, and see what, the, and, and have five or six thousand police officers turn up to try and stop you. It isn't going to happen. Yeah, and if it does, then you know maybe you'll succeed in <laughs> bringing out a few more people after they see how they brought out uh, you know hundreds of riot cops to stop uh, you know good Samaritans. So yeah, I've got, I've got another article here. <laughs> uh, the twentieth of February, twenty fourteen. That was just this year. And I was looking through something else there about uh, when they started first touting this that it's illegal to feed the homeless was back in 2011 in the UK. And uh, now now we've got it's now illegal to be homeless in, in Britain and the US, according to this article. And uh, they're talking about a place in South Carolina. That's, that's where you're from, isn't it? Columbia? South yeah. Carolina. Uh, homeless people are set to be shipped off to a camp on the outskirts of town um, because uh, it's illegal to be homeless. Yeah, and you, what's what's interesting about that is that they'll they'll put them in a camp, and they're not free to leave uh, whenever they want. There are certain hours that they can come in, and certain hours that they can go out. And you know, I that that sounds an awful lot like incarceration to me. But uh, you know, this this is something that was passed, and um, it was it was passed by this little uh, it was pushed by this little weasel in uh, the Columbia Council who. Uh, you know, ran on being a a, a charity uh, promoting individual, and this was I don't remember his name, but I did a, a report on him on one of my shows. But yeah, it was a little weasel in, in the city council who pushed this law, and uh, you know the fact, as you say, that it, it's popped up across the world, you know, especially in, in, in the Western world over the last few years is no coincidence that it just happened to pop up here and there in the United States and the United Kingdom. It's never a coincidence when you start seeing these these laws and these policies just crop up at the same time in all these diverse uh, diverse places. It's actually an agenda playing out. Yeah, and uh, the, the whole fact that it, it makes no sense either. I mean, surely uh, any any government would be happy if it's uh, in inverted commas citizens uh, went out and helped people who were less fortunate than themselves, so the, go- the government wouldn't have to bother. You yeah. think it's been to their advantage? That's what they say, you know. Whenever you whenever you argue against cuts in Social Security or unemployment insurance or Medicare or something, the response is always, "Well, you you should uh, you should look to charitable organizations to pick up the slack." Well, they're banning the charitable organizations. You know, you can't go out and 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 feed homeless people, but uh, that the, the charitable organizations only exist as a fallback whenever they they try to impose austerity. So you're getting you're getting hit on two sides. Yeah, and of course a lot of those charities are are controlled anyway, and uh, fully in bed with the the agenda as it is. And I'm, I'm sure uh, in some of these cases, some of these camps will be run by so-called charities, um, private organisations that uh, are going to get paid for everybody who gets put in them, no doubt, just like the private prisons. Well, uh, in Myrtle Beach, here in South Carolina, they were one of the biggest uh, proponents of the law that banned feeding the homeless was a charitable organisation, yeah. It's, uh, it's it's like uh, I was talking to one of the lads here. Um, it's it's another ridiculous law. Uh, anywhere in Europe, uh, not not the UK at the moment, but uh, if you drive across Europe, you have to have your headlights on 24 hours a day, <laughs> spring, summer, autumn, winter. It doesn't matter. 24 hours a day, and the on, the only uh, the only thing you can think to that is that the light bulb manufacturers have uh, lobbied the government because they won't sell enough bulbs because there's no logic to it. But the police will stop you and fine you if you don't have your lights on. In broad daylight on a sunny day. Well, we have a law here in South Carolina that's called the brown bag law. So if you go out and you buy a, a bottle of beer or um, a bottle of liquor, you, it has to be put in a in a brown paper bag. And uh, you know, if, if you don't if you don't put that in a brown paper bag, the store will be fine. And <laughs> all this was was a, a result of lobbying by the paper industry that wanted more use for their products. <laughs> Well, there was an, I mean, we're, we're getting into the kind of ridiculous now, but there was a law in Ireland that it was illegal to come out of a pub drunk. 
<laughs> and uh, but uh, you, and it was down to the guy behind the bar or the manager of the bar was going to be held responsible. But there was there was no evidence whatsoever to suggest that the person hadn't come in drunk in the first place, and you'd thrown them out. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, just just to try to one up you there uh, in Texas, they the, the police raided a bar and arrested uh, patrons for being drunk in the bar. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's actually illegal to be drunk in Britain. It's illegal to be drunk, and yet, you know, uh, the nightclubs are open until four in the morning. <laughs> so I, I think we've kind of uh, we've gone from the sublime to the ridiculous. But uh, anyway, not to worry. Um, any any final words you want to give out your websites and uh, some of the other the other sites you write on? Yeah, sure. Um, you can find my work at activistpost.com and theantimedia.org. And also, if you're interested in my work specifically, then please go to brandonturbeville.com. And that's where I repost all the articles and all of the interviews that I do. And uh, also check out my show, Truth on the Tracks, over at ucy.tv. What, what nights is that on? That's on Monday nights and Friday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay. Um, we'll possibly do this again in another month or so if you're up to it. Yeah, absolutely. Up for it, surely. Sorry. Okay, uh, we're down to the last minute, so uh, with that, we'll say good night and uh, thanks very much for your time and your your insight into all things Syrian and ISIS and gun confiscation and all that stuff and uh, a bit of uh, fun at the end as well. Uh, so it's always good to have something to laugh about because uh, at the end of the day, there's there's not an awful lot to laugh about these days. Uh, so thanks again for your time, Brandon, and uh, hope to speak to you again soon. All right, thanks for having me on. Cheers.